Welcome back to a series of podcasts. My name is James. That is Eric. And we're talking about his 2008 record sounds like this, the first full-length record, and he's celebrating it with these series of podcasts and a bunch of other stuff. 2008, I don't think the iPhone even existed yet. No, right? We were just, we were just calling people on a flip phone, using T9. Dark ages. Landline. It's crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Okay, speaking of which, you wrote this song when? Outside Villanova, the third song I should mention, the third song in the this, in the series. When this did you write this? Probably song? written in two thousand four or two thousand five. And you were how old then? Twenty four, twenty five. Okay, so do you think? And this was back then. Do you think that this necessarily? Do, do you think this is a hard question to ask? But do you think this song has aged well in the sense where the subject matter? We should just clear the air that this song. I get asked about the lyrics maybe more than any song. Oh, I'm sure and the you do. The question I always get asked is one. What are you talking about in this song? Exactly. And two, is it true? And so let me just go on record of saying this is a fictional song okay. based on what could have happened. And now I'm trying to decide if I feel dirty or because it gets hard to tell. Because if it's just black and white, she's got a mind of her own. And she uses it well. So she invites me over outside Bella. I did a show in Pennsylvania outside Villanova and there was this girl there that was just a little extra we would say now. She was just a little too, she was a thirst trap. It was like a little too much and I was just like, this is a little too easy, you're a little too into it. Right. I don't know what's going on. You're gonna wake up chained in the closet with all your money gone. Yeah, and she was just, uh, (laughs) she just had an odd energy but she wanted to hang out afterwards and and I was like, I gotta drive home, like, so I just took that experience and I, I built out from there. Like a great writer would. It's a situation that could have happened and exactly. has happened for thousands of times over the course of rock and roll history. We should say the song deals with uh, a young man having uh, a relation with someone who's of the younger age. And there are direct references in the history of pop and rock and roll to this. Yeah, it this, used to be cool to it, date your 16-year-old friend. Yes, and they would mention this in there. There's there songs like Sweet Little 16 and Ringo sang the song when he was like 40. So my, my, so we, yeah. we're not going to talk about that. So it's, it is a, but I think things like she's only drinking soda revving up that motor is, yeah. is extremely smarmy, tongue-in-cheek. This is what I love about you. But after, in two, 2022, 2023 years, it's very interesting. It is a snapshot of that time, and we have come to understand, and thank goodness I have a 14-year-old daughter, that these things are insane. But these things did happen to young men, especially on the road. Yeah, right? and you know, it's I knew it wasn't me. Well, I mean, I am telling the song, but I know it didn't happen. But most of this record is deeply confessional writing. So I right. understand how throwing this one in there gets a little confusing. And again, it's an upbeat song and you're kind of grooving to it and you're like, wait, what's happening here? <laughs> so get up, I gotta go to work Facing all these people and I know I'm a jerk And it's a set up, I gotta change my clothes Concealing all this evidence before everybody knows What I've done and what I'm gonna do Again the greatest thing you did in this song, for my money, is what I call the absolution verse. So you're just throwing it back at the person. And in the middle of the night, I have a breakdown of sorts. So you are conflicted morally, consciously, with regret creeping in. She's going to put up a fight. She will get her way because she loves sleeping in. Some woman pride with me, but I'm undecided. So 
So you're kind of tossing it on her. It's like she has responsibility in this as well. Oh, in this song, to me, she is the underage femme fatale who has entrapped me. Right. Poor old you. Poor, poor, pitiful me. <laughs> fictionally. But yeah, that was what I had envisioned for myself had I chased this situation. Um, Do you know that she was younger? She should not have been in that club? I don't know. I don't know. It was just a weird vibe. But I think so, because I think she came to another show and had to have like an older person escort her in. Because you could, could have written about a, a femme fatale or a woman that was dangerous that didn't yeah. have to be young. Yeah. I don't really know where or why this song came out or why it worked or why people like it necessarily. Love it. It's one of but the... But also, I wrote a lot of like weird, creepy songs back then. I had a song called Apartment... 7B or something that was from the point of view of a, a super in the building, like the superintendent who was running a apartment building and was obsessed with this couple in apartment 2B or whatever. And he ends up, he's like, he's just telling their whole story and then in the end he kills them. Ah, very and, Hitchcock. Uh, yeah, but like not what people want out of a pop song. Yeah, no, well, but, unless you know, you're Warren Zevon. Exactly. Yeah, and I was Randy interested Newman. in that world of like an unreliable storyteller and, and like an interesting weird song and stuff. Thank you for mentioning that. The unreliable protagonist or storyteller or voice or narrator. I, when I first met you, I really, really was trying to connect my love of Randy Newman and Warren Zevon with you because you went there. You played with different ideas. I, I think of, you know, uh, we mentioned Poor Poor Pitiful Me, but something like Excitable Boy. <laughs> it's, it's a doo-wop song about a maniac who rapes and kills a woman. Mm. That was like probably his second most famous song besides Werewolves of London. So you went there more, and I, I really appreciated that as a writer. I liked the weirdness of it, and my songs were pretty poppy and catchy, and then I thought throwing some of that stuff in there. It's like just Sting. my sense of humor. That's another one, right? So isn't there a song, Don't Stand So Close to Me? Sting's the police mentioned. songs are sad and they're creepy they're as very hell. Creepy. All of them are creepy. He even mentions Nabokov in that yeah, song. That one is Lolita, I believe. He's like straight it's on. Pretty much yeah. Lolita. He's a teacher. But yeah, it's a mind. similar song to Don't Stand So Close to Me or something. But but it's upbeat and everyone gladly sings along, Get up, I gotta go to work. Right, right. This is like the worst moment of this person's life. Right, and he actually um, calls himself a jerk or yes. feeling like a jerk. And that's a good one yeah, where I'm calling myself a jerk or the character. And I wanted to shout out Two, Gary sure. Novak playing drums on this on a lot of this record. He was uh, he played with Chick Corea a bunch. He was way out of my league and, and came into the project and then brought in Chris Cheney who played bass, another really accomplished touring bass player who had toured with Jane's Addiction and Alanis and um, I'm blanking on a bunch of stuff. But I like might have seen him with Alanis. Yeah, they were mm -hmm. awesome and yeah. uh, they came in and. I was listening to that today. Gary Novak really, he gives that Motown feel to start this song. Yes. It's very Motown y. I've also, I'd like to point out, I've had several people tell me that they have won their NCAA Final Four brackets because they just picked Villanova all the way because they recognized it from my song, and then they won one year, so. Yeah, they did win a couple of years ago, right, right. There you go. Um, I wrote this, I don't know why, but this to me is the most telling line. And then I wrote, can you explain this? So we ready? That she's only sinking when I'm sleeping by her side with a change of thinking, I can pull us away even just for a day. That she's only It's very ambiguous, that line. And it comes in at the, because it's very storyteller, as I mentioned, but at the end, this is very yeah, poetic. Yeah, and that's the sort of line that I sort of, I think I hear now, and maybe I would sharpen now, maybe more. But I think in general, this song is a person grappling with having made a poor decision and dealing deeply with the regret of it and being like, if I could just get away from all this, if we could get away from this whole situation, we'd be fine, but like, this is the world we're in, and... Um, which is basically Lolita. <laughs> he kidnaps her in that book, which is, by the <laughs> way, one of the most gorgeously written books of all time, but it's horrifying, certainly, and you're not going there. But this idea of, 
if we lived in a different world. The song it's reminding me of that I never made a connection to is Norwegian Wood by John Lennon, where, again, he goes over and this girl is into it too much, and so he sleeps in the bath and... and uh, she, she, she intimidates him. Yeah, but yeah. it's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, now I'm thinking about it, yeah, it's like, it's a femme fatale thing, but I... I don't know. Again, I don't know where this song came from. It's odd that I'm still singing it all these years later. Right, it's right. odd that people are requesting it. They like they love it in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and um, but it's a it's an interesting song and it's upbeat. And again, it's got this really percussive yep. piano thing that I was doing. And uh, well, that's to your credit because it's a great song. You could be singing about marbles. You could be singing about the sun. It doesn't matter. It, it's make, it's a great structured song, you're singing it very well. But there is some deep commentary in here about what could happen or whatever, and I think that that's a great well, marriage I think of some those of those things. weird quirky lyrics and things that I, things I chose to sing about, I would hope that's what set me apart from some of the other contemporaries I had at the time was like, this stuff's catchy, but like a little bit odd. And you know, sometimes to my detriment, probably commercially or whatever, but yeah, I wanted to make music that was like different, I guess. Right. She grows impatient to change my tone. She's getting older and legal soon. And I wasn't ready to start out and go upset at some girl that I'd be forgetting by the time the cops came by that afternoon. And I tried to decide as she pulled me aside. Uh, yes, and I, I, I love in the bridge how you're talking about the cops storming in and she's getting older and legal soon. Um, this, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm going to comment it on, on a song later on, is the bridge in halftime on this song? Do you go to halftime? I believe you do. You do this a couple of times on this I think record. so, and I remember them pointing out that like it's got an odd number of bars in it. Like It yes. should have one extra in resolve or something, but that was me just kind of like feeling it the way it was but going. quirky and great but i think is there is that something a producer made his decision on or did you arrange the song to go into halftime bridges i don't remember i it was probably something that we found in the studio that they that okay. maybe the drummer would have recommended or something right and just you know for purposes if, if you're playing at this rhythm and then the you know the bridge just slows it down. It's the same rhythm, but you're every other beat. Yeah. The yeah. It's and way of changing the changing the feel. Yeah, and it works beautifully on here. Um, I, I, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm going to read it because it's a lot. Uh, you were kind enough to ask me to write the liner notes we mentioned in an earlier podcast for the vinyl release uh, reissue of Sounds Like This. And one of the things that I discovered when I was writing it is how much this album is a perfect, perfect thing, uh, we've talked about this before, a perfect opening salvo, but it's also a snapshot of youth, the desperation the lust, the confusion, the germination of a personality. And it is what you will eventually do in your songs as an art form. But in a way, you did it with these songs. So you wanted to be quirky, you wanted to be different, and maybe it was a detriment later on. But I think this song in particular is sort of the foundation of what Eric Hutchinson is going to do, all the way to modern happiness and songs, fun songs about death. And you know, you know what I mean? It's like you, this is your first, hey, I'm going for it. This is going to be me. Do you agree? Yeah, I think that's a good. I think that's a good um, summation. And I think it also falls into. Yeah, this album. When I listen to the songs, these songs were about dating. They were about breakups, and they were about just being out there, being in my twenties, being single, and bumping up against different kinds of people. So I think also this probably just falls under the category of like. The weird stuff that happens when you're single. <laughs> it's so true. And the choices you have to make. And the choices you make, or you don't make, uh, in this case. Um, and lastly, but very important, this I, I note that this is your first foray into ska reggae, which you use a lot on this record, but also in your songwriting. Um, do you love working in this format, or do you find yourself kind of in it? And you're, oh, here I go again. Like how, how does that I work? I did at some point in a certain record, I was like, no ska songs on this record. <laughs> But yeah, I love <laughs> reggae, I love ska, I love Bob Marley. And again, going back to playing by myself solo, it's extremely rhythmic by yourself. And I would play right. it like that, and when I'd play the guitar, I'd do this sort of the skank yeah, and that. slaps and create a beat. And um, I think I just found that that works, but also it's upbeat, 
I have a theory that reggae is the best form of music because you can take any song and turn it into a reggae song, <laughs> yes. and it's still good, if not better. Right, and happier. But you, but you can't do that with any other genre. You can't do that with, a, I mean, a metal song or something, right. or country music. Some songs won't work, but any song can be turned into a reggae song, and it sounds good. Right, so you could turn, say, like, uh, <laughs> Hurt by... Um... That'd be amazing. <laughs> Is it the Johnny Cash version of that? Yeah, by Nine Inch Nails, that'd <laughs> yeah, be great. That's yeah. great. All right, so just so we have on record, because we're doing these podcasts, Outside Villanova is completely fiction, correct? It is pure fiction, if you will. Well done, my friend. All right, so we have finished up the third track of Sounds Like This, Outside Villanova. One of my favorites, one of the ones that were on that was on the live album, which, uh, which yeah. you know, made me fall in love with Eric and want to do write about him and we're doing these podcasts. So let's go on to the fourth uh, track, I should say. I'm James, that's Eric, and this is the 15th anniversary celebration of Sounds Like This. And I gotta change my clothes, get sealing all, and sever dance for everybody knows is what I've done. 